Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for being with us. My name is John Bagnulo, and I am uh, the Director of Nutrition and Research and Development for Functional Formularies. And I, I want to thank you for being with us today uh, in this discussion of I, what I feel to be one of the most pivotal areas of human health. And it appears, you know, every month based on the research that is surfacing around the world that our mitochondria are more often than not at that interface between our environment and our diet uh, and various tissues or organs in the human body that you know we become focused on with respect to certain types of diseases and conditions so you know we felt that it would be timely to offer this information this afternoon to really help help uh, participants understand more about the mitochondria, their role in health, and how we can maintain a viable mitochondrial population, which ultimately um, is one of the most essential aspects of cellular physiology. And really, the, what we're looking at uh, this afternoon are the primary differences between healthy mitochondria and damaged mitochondria, and all the different factors that can contribute to what we call mitochondrial pathology. So it's our intent uh, this afternoon to learn about the primary mechanisms responsible for this pathology. Why is it mitochondria become less functional? To identify those uh, different qualities, you know, food choices and specific ingredients or nutrients that have the ability, especially when consumed on a regular basis to contribute to that mitochondrial pathology that we're talking about. To look at how the microbiome, of course, the importance of, you know, that four to five pounds of bacteria in our distal small intestine and large intestine to see how that influences mitochondrial function, as well as some other environmental exposures that we can minimize ourselves uh, or exposure to. And then ultimately where the, you know, really where we, where this all meets the road is how can we choose healthier foods and foods that are much more supportive of mitochondrial health? So those are our objectives. And, you know, again, this may be a refresher for some of our participants this afternoon with respect to the mitochondria, you know, what is it that's really unique about these tiny organelles? I think in summary, I would say that mitochondria are responsible for the vast majority of energy in the human body. Uh, again, that has to take us back to the Krebs cycle, what we call um, aerobic or oxidative respiration, meaning that it requires oxygen to uh, convert fatty acids to energy in the form of ATP. All of that is run through the mitochondria. These are the most metabolically active organelles within a cell, and they are found in the highest concentrations in those human tissues or organs that have the greatest metabolic activity. So if you think about areas of the body where we need to have large amounts of energy being produced on a regular basis, it's very easy to identify those. You have the liver, the kidneys, the brain, the heart, you know, those would really stand out as your top four requiring large amounts of energy around the clock. Often we get focused on skeletal muscle, but skeletal muscle in comparison to those other organs gets extensive breaks over any 24 hour period of time. These mitochondria are essential for that fatty acid oxidation. Uh, and when they start to fail, all of these tissues and, and these organs in particular, these systems start to break down from that energy deficit. The pathology of mitochondria goes way beyond what many people are familiar with, which is called mitochondrial myopathy, which is a skeletal muscular condition. Um, you know, sometimes people are familiar with uh, that condition because of world-renowned athletes such as Greg LeMond, uh, you know, one of the early U.S. cyclists to gain fame and to win the Tour de France. Um, you know, Greg LeMond is an example of a world-class athlete who suffered or was afflicted by this condition, but it's far more, you know, reaching than just skeletal muscle. We have clear um, connections to mitochondrial issues or dysfunction in every organ system. Certainly with respect to cardiac failure or ischemia, um, a wide variety of neurodegenerative diseases from the more common such as Parkinson's and ALS um, to some of those others that are uh, less 
frequent, had lower incidence rates, but renal failure, cancer, ataxia, different forms of ataxia, uh, sarcopenia, which we know has a multitude of factors that contribute to the etiology of that particular condition or disease, but mitochondrial health is front and center. And of course, dementia, a loss of cognitive function can certainly be tied to less functional mitochondrial uh, capacities. So there's widespread implications for a loss in functional mitochondria. Um, and so with that being said, I, I think it's important now to really delve into some of the intricacies of mitochondrial communication and control over, over cellular function. And one thing that's uh, most interesting is that substances produced by the mitochondria, not necessarily ATP or adenosine triphosphate, which is the primary source of energy to be used by most uh, cells in the body. But in addition to that, the mitochondria, when generating this energy, generates these reactive oxygen species, which you see here in the lower right-hand corner of this slide. Those reactive oxygen species, um, which often are given uh, you know, negative qualities with respect to human health, they also play important roles as stimulus, as a stimulus factor for the production of things such as activated protein kinase uh, you know, and other NFKB. You know, these, these, are, these substances are really important to have in balance. You need to have just enough of those reactive oxygen species to stimulate important components in gene transcription. Um, the acetyl-CoA is also important for uh, just looking at histone, uh, histone acetylation reactions, again, within, within our DNA, that gene transcription. So there's this back and forth communication between our mitochondria and our DNA held in the nucleus. It isn't just a one-way street, um, but the balance of those reactive oxygen species that you see on this slide, which are a stimulus for some favorable changes, it's the amount of that reactive oxygen species pool, that quantity, which can either make or break us. Excessive amounts of these reactive oxygen species, because we don't have adequate endogenous antioxidants being produced, or we don't uh, consume enough, let's just say, vegetables and uh, brightly colored uh, fruits and spices and things along those lines, which are rich in antioxidants. An inadequate quantity of antioxidants available to the mitochondria will ultimately bring about their demise because of these reactive oxygen species. So it's always a, a balance and it's really important that it be discussed that way. In the case of sarcopenia, these excessive reactive oxygen species are one of the more primary causes for the loss of viable skeletal muscle, uh, which has to be supported by mitochondria. So if we don't have enough mitochondria in our muscle, uh, eventually that muscle disappears. Um, you know, that's really what we're talking about with mus muscular atrophy and, and, and that which typically occurs later in life. You know, often it's associated with things like a vitamin D deficiency, inadequate protein, obviously, inadequate weight bearing exercises or strength training all of these things are important they're all a facet of sarcopenia if they're absent but the presence of excessive amounts of reactive oxygen species overwhelming the mitochondria through inflammatory reactions is a prime driver of sarcopenia so that's just again this is one one example of where a loss in mitochondrial function is going to really affect a particular type of human tissue or organ when it comes to renal health, we know that cystic kidneys have a very unique um, quality or the absence of mitochondrial function. So these, these uh, afflicted kidneys tend to be totally dependent on glycolysis, which is how we run glucose uh, for a modest amount of ATP without using the Krebs cycle or the mitochondria. You know, that's actually called the Warburg effect. It was um, discovered by Dr. Warburg back in the early 1900s. And we know that it's not really just with respect to uh, cystic kidneys and, and renal disease. We know that it's also a primary cause of most forms of cancer. And that's why oncologists um, who are studying this, as well as researchers such as Thomas Seafried at Boston College, are making a strong case for cancer to be looked at as a chronic disease or a metabolic disease. And what this slide depicts is 
how mitochondria, when damaged, which you can see on the far left-hand side by a variety of conditions, whether those be oncogene, uh, oncoviruses, carcinogens, you know, that damaged mitochondria also causes the same thing we talked about in the previous slide, which is an over-reliance on glycolysis, which is where cancer cells really start to generate uh, the vast majority of their energy and that the progression of tumor tumors and cancer in general are much greater when you have lower levels of this oxidative uh, phosphorylation, lower levels of, of mitochondrial uh, energy production or beta oxidation. So, you know, it's really interesting to see all of the different um, conditions and diseases, but they have this core similarity, which is where the mitochondria are not helping a particular uh, tissue organ generate enough energy to be functional, or in the case of cancer, um, it's completely absent. And then there are chemical pathways which are initiated by an over-reliance on glycolysis or carbohydrate metabolism that really lends itself to um, angiogenesis and, and vascularization of a tumor. So, you know, and I'm going to share with you um, throughout this discussion some excellent papers that I would encourage you to look at when you have an opportunity that really take a, a deep um, dive examination of mitochondrial dysfunction and its connection to different types of symptoms and conditions. One of the better ones um, is by Morris and Burke, and it looks at the different ways in which mitochondrial dysfunction arises. And we're going to cover those this afternoon. We're going to look at you know three or four different uh, primary causes or mechanisms involved in the pathology of mitochondria. This is an excellent paper um, that discusses those. You know, one of the most important ones is the overall abundance of highly um, peroxidizable or oxidizable lipids. And these are highly polyunsaturated fatty acids. In, in particular, the omega-6 fats, a loss of membrane integrity or an excessive amount of mitochondrial membrane permeability, leaky, permeable, excessively permeable mitochondrial membranes. Um, we've already briefly discussed an excessive amount of reactive oxygen species in relationship to the endogenous antioxidants that should be there. And then there are specific toxins that can also really knock out mitochondria because of some of the unique effects they have on biochemical pathways within that organelle. Now, these are those four, lipid peroxidation, especially when it comes to the um, industrial seed oil, omega-6 fatty acid rich uh, fats. You know, you see over the course of this talk and you'll see in my uh, recommended reading or references toward the back of this talk, I'll, you know, highlight some of the better papers that look at omega-6 fatty acids and their influence on mitochondrial health. And across the board, they're damaging. We know that they contribute to inflammatory uh, pathways in the body. And we know that the average American diet, and, and for that matter, the average industrialized modern diet is excessive in its omega-6 fatty acid content and very low in its omega-3 fatty acid content. So this is a very consistent theme throughout most examinations of chronic disease, and it's no exception. Mitochondrial health is by and large determined by a few factors, dietary factors, and the types of fatty acids present in any population's diet is often reflected in mitochondrial health later in life. Excess, excessive reactive oxygen species, again, they're, they're going to be a inherent part of mitochondrial metabolism. Anytime you um, are producing ATP, there will be these reactive oxygen species generated, and that's okay. What's important is that the body and that cells have adequate amounts of endogenously produced antioxidants. One of the big ones is superoxide dismutase, SOD, and there are different forms of that. You know, some dependent on zinc and some more dependent on manganese. Um, then there's glutathione peroxidase. You know, these are examples of these antioxidants that we produce in our body from specific trace minerals having adequate amounts of those trace minerals, having adequate amounts of protein and certain amino acids. And those are the most powerful antioxidants we have in our body, the ones which we produce naturally. But then of course, it's you get added benefit from the antioxidants found in dark green vegetables and in spices like turmeric and in certain fruits like berries and uh, citrus peels and things along those lines. So there's this, you know, again, there's this balance that we have to have 
physiologically, we have to have a certain amount of these reactive oxygen species. We can't have inadequate, but we can't have an excessive amount. And then we have to have the antioxidants to balance those out. And when there's an imbalance, when we're generating large amounts of these free radicals, in essence, or reactive oxygen species, we're going to damage healthy tissue. Uh, environmental toxins, there's pesticides and agrochemicals such as herbicides and things along those lines, which are clearly, um, clearly damaging to mitochondria. And we can see that um, with an investigation that each and every one of those pesticides, which have known effects on neurological health in particular. And then there's mitochondria, uh, mycotoxins, which are produced by mold. Um, we know there are bacterially derived uh, toxins, such as those which are produced by blue-green algae, cyanobacter. We really see the link between cyanobacter exposure, the toxins produced by those bacteria, in Parkinson's and ALS, where the mitochondria are really knocked out by those toxins. And, and, and those uh, individuals that suffer from those conditions tend to lose a large percentage of viable mitochondria um, over time with those toxins uh, being produced either from the GI or from their environmental exposure. And then, you know, one that is, I think, most interesting um, because of how it connects fructose consumption to all of these different types of metabolic diseases that we see people being afflicted with at an unprecedented rate and knowing how much fructose is in the average, uh, average again, person's diet living in an industrialized world, we can look at the, metabol the metabolites of fructose metabolism. And again, fructose is very different than glucose and other carbohydrates. Fructose requires phosphorylation. So we have to take some phosphorus off of an ATP molecule and attach that to the fructose. And that whole chemical pathway or process generates these advanced glycosylated end products, one of which is known as methyl glyoxyl. That's really damaging to cellular health, especially the mitochondria. So we'll take a look at that. We'll really look closely at fructose metabolism, what's different about it, and how methyl glyoxyl may be a driving force behind so much of the uh, mitochondrial pathology. So these are the mechanisms. And the first one we're going to look at is the high level of omega-6 fatty acids and how that relates um, to this. We know that you know the average American has a ratio of somewhere 30 to 1, maybe it's 32 to 1, but it's in that area. It's very, uh, very consistent depending on whose research you look at. And we know that over the course of human history, left to more of an ancestral diet, uh, where there's an absence of these more modern industrial seed oils, it, the ratio has always been consistently three to one, um, never higher than four to one, in some cases, maybe two to one, but it's three to one on average. And we know that it might take a ratio of one to one to actually reduce uh, inflammation, reverse some of those processes once the fires really, um, once they catch. And if we look at some of the more common oils used in food products, ranging from, you know, food products for the critically ill, medical, uh, you know, settings to those which are maybe a part of snack foods or school lunches, we know that safflower oil, sunflower oil, uh, corn oil, you know, those, those oils tend to present soybean oil as well, a large percentage of the calories in the average American's diet. And they're high in their omega-6 content, very low in their omega-3 content, highly polyunsaturated. So they really don't lend themselves. They don't have the biological compatibility to withstand all of the oxidative stress that's present in a mitochondrial membrane. And so that's really where things start to go wrong. We're building these mitochondrial membranes out of, in essence, flammable fats, highly flammable or highly oxidizable fats that become lipid peroxides and turn up inflammation and ultimately cause the demise of mitochondria. We know that there's different mechanisms behind those omega-6 fats and how they contribute to this pathology. One of the mechanisms is just the pro-inflammatory mediators that they help generate, such as prostaglandins of the series two variety. Um, you know, PGE2 you see here at the kind of lower left-hand side. You got leukotrienes. Um, again, even series tend to be pro-inflammatory. Your twos and fours, thromboxanes, it's like TXA2. You know, these are all pro-inflammatory icosanoids, in essence, hormones that can cause this kind of chronic inflammation around the clock when we have an over, an over abundance or a, a greater body pool of omega-6 fats such as arachidonic acid in our membranes and not that modest amount that's just required for a healthy immune system. 
We also know that these, what we often refer to as oxidized linoleic acid metabolites, abbreviated as OXLAM, these oxlams, when those are present within a cell or acquired by a cell, in their own way, they trigger a cascade of further reactive oxygen species production generation, in essence, more free radicals within the cell. And that changes gene transcription, that changes the mitochondria, um, and especially some of the complexes. And those complexes, as you see on this slide, complex one, have a huge role over how a mitochondria population within one type of cell really helps nourish that cell with energy. So those complexes, which are found out there um, in that outer membrane of the mitochondria, they can be greatly altered by the presence of these um, lipid peroxides in the case of linoleic acid specifically. And, you know, really when it comes down to how mitochondrial uh, health or mitochondrial membrane fatty acid or lipid composition, how that influences cardiovascular health. The irony in this story is that, you know, for the last 40 or 50 years, Americans have been steered away from saturated fat uh, and monounsaturated fat has been, you know, more often than not accepted under the public health umbrella, but we've been steered away from saturated fat towards these less stable, easily oxidized polyunsaturated fats, which again, lower serum cholesterol levels. So that's why they've historically been looked at as favorable changes. But when we look at what happens in the presence of ischemia uh, and reperfusion, there is a much greater amount of calcium leakage. Um, there's a much less stable mitochondrial membrane when those cardiac cells contain mitochondria that are comprised of high amounts of omega-6 or, or PUFA-rich uh, fatty acids. You know, the, the omega-3 polyunsaturated fats, whether they come from flax oil or fish oil, those tend to have much more favorable influences on mitochondrial health. A lot of that has to do with how they influence cardiolipin regeneration and production. And cardiolipin is a very unique molecule within the membrane of mitochondria um, that really helps stabilize that mitochondrial membrane and keep it going in a, in, a, in a highly functional direction. Once there's an absence or a deficiency in cardiolipin, either because there's an overabundance of omega-6s or not enough omega-3s, and things start to break down rapidly. But, you know, calcium leakage from cardiac tissue um, is certainly, um, it's accelerated by the excessive uh, presence of omega-6 fatty acids. And then, you know, it seems like always the case when it comes down to omega-6 fats versus omega-3 fats and the roles of, of lipids in cellular health, uh, San, Sanjoy Ghosh is, I, I consider, one of the foremost experts in the world on the role of lipids in health and disease. And, you know, really, Dr. Ghosh's work here with, um, with omega-6 fatty acids in the mitochondrial uh, membrane and the dysfunction there and how that relates to uh, peroxynitrite production is without exception. Um, and really, Sanjoy's work has shown that higher levels of omega-6 fatty acids within the membrane of the mitochondria allows for greater productions of the peroxynitrite free radical, which you see on the left-hand side of the screen, which is, again, very damaging um, to all aspects of cellular health, but the mitochondrial membrane in particular. So there's just, you know, really that fine, there's a, there's a limited window of physiological compatibility with respect to these omega-6 fats. You know, they really need to be 5% of calories or less. And that's just not the case across um, the industrialized world. Most populations are being steered towards uh, the cheapest, you know, lowest quality ingredients. And that is a diet that's typically made up of omega-6 rich seed oils and highly carbohydrate dense sweeteners, sweetened foods, and just an overload of carbohydrates in general. And that ultimately creates the perfect storm for our mitochondria. So, Shifting gears now, we'll take a look at a few environmental exposures and pesticides in particular um, that have been shown to be very detrimental to mitochondrial health. And this would, again, this should strengthen our resolve 
uh, whether we're a clinician, care provider, or uh, just looking out for our own health or our family's health to choose organic uh, vegetables, fruits, and, and all foods if possible due to their lower pesticide and agrochemical content. Rotenone is well known. Uh, rotenone is a is a, a form of pesticide that's been used for decades, um, but it was in the early 1990s that it first started to um, be connected to Parkinson's people that were using rotenone, people that were inadvertently consuming rotenone on a more regular basis were being uh, shown to be at much higher risk for Parkinson's. We know now that uh, rotenone has a um, very damaging effect on the mitochondria and in particular it can overwhelm or inhibit um, the superoxide dismutase that's important for protection protecting uh, various complexes within that membrane so rotenone is a is a pesticide that we've had a connection um, to mitochondrial health for a much longer period of time than let's say uh, some of these uh, more recent additions in the way of pesticides or agrochemicals uh, paraquat you know, chlorpyrifos, those have been examined with respect to mitochondrial complex one activity, and they also have been shown to greatly inhibit the ability of that particular protein within the mitochondrial membrane uh, to serve that to serve that organelle and to help the cell uh, acquire energy as needed. So, and again, th these you know these papers range from the rote known papers that are twenty to thirty years old to now those which are just two or three years old, looking at many common pesticides that are in widespread use around the world. Here in the U.S., we know that chlorpyrifos and paraquat are found in most conventional vegetables and fruits. So it's not as though these are going to be limited to other areas of the world. These are in widespread use. And, you know, when we talk about chlorpyrifos, um, you know, talk that, that I offered recently on why it's important to choose organic uh, foods really highlighted what's been shown with children and brain development um, at various stages of, of development or various ages. And we know that chlorpyrifos exposure causes very unique changes in the brain at any given age. Uh, there's, there's research to look at um, cognitive scores, developmental indexes, and all of these things are um, delayed or, or are stunted with exposure with chronic dietary exposure to these common pesticides. So, so again, it should really strengthen our resolve to, to really to pro provide healthy food for those people that are often the most vulnerable. Now, we're gonna look at fructose, which I just wanna say, um, again, this may be new to, to some of the participants this afternoon. Fructose is often discussed on the surface whether that's in an advertisement that one might see or in um, you know, some type of um, basic journal as though it's just another form of carbohydrate. And I wanna be really clear that fructose is very unique in how it's metabolized by the human body. Over the course of human history, and I've said this for the last 25 years in various talks I've given, our exposure, our dietary exposure to fructose has been very limited. We have had limited windows of time with which fruit has been available to us, depending on where we live. Even in tropical regions of the world, fruit is not available year round. Certainly when you get to more northern latitudes, you have even shorter windows of time. And keep in mind, every animal, every insect, you name it, is competing for that fruit in the two to three week window of which it's available. So our exposure to fructose as a species has been very limited throughout the majority of human history. And it's only in the last 100 years or so that fruit has been available for much of the year and in the types of quantities that it is now. And it's only been in the last 30 years that things like high fructose corn syrup and agave and some of these very fructose rich sweeteners have been available or have been present in our diet. So it goes without saying, human populations around the world, especially in those more industrialized areas, it's at an unprecedented level. We have never before consumed the amount of fructose that we are consuming now. And we're really starting to see the effects, especially in some of our older generations 
um, who have had enough exposure to that fructose, as well as in our pediatric population, which has the highest incidence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease ever seen before. This all comes down to fructose. It isn't just another source of sugar. It isn't just another source of carbohydrate. It's a very different type. And as I mentioned earlier, when fructose is metabolized, it has to be phosphorylated. When that takes place, you can see on this slide on the far left-hand side, you generate uric acid. By the way, uric acid is a clear biomarker, a clearly associated with heart disease, diabetes, a variety of metabolic conditions. It is not simply something we have to be concerned about with respect to gout. And uric acid levels in the body are not, by and large, a function of consuming foods like hard cheeses or sardines or meats. Most of the uric acid in the average American's body unequivocally is a byproduct of fructose metabolism. And at the same time, when we phosphorylate this fructose and the aldolase enzyme comes into play, we form methylglyoxal. That's that advanced glycation end product, often referred to as an age molecule that we know is responsible for the pathology of mitochondria. So fructose is something that may play an equally pivotal role when you look at dietary qualities or nutrients in the average diet, it is right there with the over uh, abundance of omega-6 fatty acids. By some estimates, we can consume around 10 grams of fructose per meal safely, 25 grams of fructose per day. Researchers such as Robert Lustig, who's one of the foremost experts on fructose, has pointed us in this direction with his research. But make no mistake about it, the average American is consuming three to four times that amount of fructose. And some of those sources are often, um, you know, under the umbrella of good intentions. And we'll look at those in a moment. And methylglyoxal, um, it should be noted, is being so linked to diabetes that now it is emerging as one of the more effective biomarkers in detecting diabetes or the progression of that disease because methylglyoxal is in a way as an age molecule or an advanced gly glycosylated end product, it's a lot like hemoglobin A1C, but it may in fact be an even more accurate representation of the ability of a patient to follow um, particular way of eating that's more supportive of um, what's needed during diabetes. So methylglyoxal is something that you will see more and more um, in the headlines, especially with its relationship to diabetes. And it probably will be a while before um, it, we start to see it being more closely tied to mitochondrial diseases. But I, I am confident that that day will also come. This methylglyoxal, again, it has epigenetic type effects, so it influences um, gene transcription. Obviously, as we've talked about, it increases the amount of oxidative stress and damage to the mitochondria. And it also causes a loss in very important viable proteins and the degradation of those. So it's, uh, it, it's affecting other areas of cellular health, not just the mitochondria. And it plays a big role in the aging process. It's been, again, it's been shown uh, there's empirical evidence that higher levels of methylglyoxal are responsible for accelerated aging um, across the board. So whether we're looking at the mitochondria, we're looking at the health of our DNA and how many breaks we have in those strands, we're looking at, you know, really just organ health overall, higher levels of methylglyoxal and an inability to metabolize that and detoxify it is a clear factor in the aging process. And this is an excellent paper, excellent paper on the presence of methylglyoxal um, in healthy and unhealthy aging processes. Uh, methylglyoxal is also known as a dicarbonyl molecule. Um, this 2019 paper is an excellent one, and it really connects its presence in the diet and the body to a variety of different types of pathologies, not just mitochondrial. 
Fructose is found in so many different sweeteners at varying levels. Um, you can see agave, for instance, is 88% fructose, which is interesting given the fact that sometimes, you know, certain groups look at agave as being a healthier sweetener. Certainly not the case. Uh, fruit juice concentrates typically have higher levels. You know, you can see that apple juice concentrate is around 67% fructose. So those numbers vary depending on the sweetener. But what I want to make really clear is that fructose can be, it can be consumed in a variety of foods that really aren't technically sweeteners. They're, they're fruits for the most part. And so if you look at the left-hand side of this chart, you'll see the fructose content of a typical portion. Obviously, dried fruits are going to be very high because of how concentrated they are. But one half mango, just a half of a mango, has over 16 grams of fructose. Um, you know, so keep in mind, one cup of mango would have 32 grams of fructose. Now, you've already exceeded how much fructose a typical human can metabolize safely over the course of a day. So you go down that list, or I should say you go up that list, and you get to places where there's some really good news. I mean, one cup of cranberries has less than a gram of fructose and a wealth of polyphenols and a wealth of um, prebiotic qualities that feed really healthy bacteria populations, such as acromancia. So you've got some really good choices on that list of fruits, and you've got some others that you probably want to save for special occasions. It adds up fast. Um, dietary fructose, it's, it's something that we should be as a, a nutritionist, a dietitian, uh, a clinician that is dealing with populations who have metabolic disease. Fructose is something that we should clearly be trying to assess and quantify in our patient's diet. And we should be advising our patients to choose better fruits with lower fructose contents. And of course, to avoid fruit juice and fruit juice concentrates. And those really cannot, you know, in a healthy way, provide a significant number of calories. It just doesn't, it just doesn't work. And this is a great paper. It's a 2018 paper that I, that I, I think many people find eye-opening, and it looks at the effects of apples and apple juice on acute plasma uric acid concentrations. And what it shows is that fructose is a challenge. Metabolically, it is a challenge for our cells and our liver, regardless of the source. doesn't mean we can't enjoy an apple. It just means people can overconsume whole fruits in the case of an apple. And certainly, it's very easy to overconsume fruit juices and fruit juice concentrates. But often, again, fructose in, in the form of fruit is given a pass. This paper would really question uh, that approach. So in the time that we have left, in the last 10 to 15 minutes or so, in, in, in the interest of questions you might have, I want to just really give you an overview of the critical difference makers that separate damaged mitochondria from healthy mitochondria. What is it we can do? And, and like, as I said earlier, we know that it isn't, typically it isn't just one thing. Typically we have exposure to agrochemicals that may, in the case of glyphosate, cause dysbiosis or clostridium overgrowth. We know that that is going to produce, and that pack population of bacteria tends to produce higher levels of propionic acid, especially when it's given a very grain-based or carbohydrate-dense diet. That propionic acid is very damaging to the mitochondria. We know that fructose is rich in these methylglyoxal metabolites. That damages the mitochondria. So we have different factors. And of course, the, the omega-6 rich seed oils and the prostaglandins of the series two, those are inflammatory. So we have multi a multitude of potential factors going on. How is it we prioritize those? How is it we really start to focus on the most attainable and sustainable changes um, for the patients we're working with. Number one, provide patients with the appropriate choices of fats. It's time that we question the advocacy for omega-6 rich seed oils. They just don't work. And it's a time to return to safer, more biologically compatible oils that have been used for essentially centuries, olive oil, coconut oil, saturated fat and monounsaturated fat that can be supplemented with omega-3 rich oils, either in the case of flax oil for those who um, 
you know, find it important to avoid fish and seafood or fish oil, oily fish for those who uh, are open to eating those foods. So the oil change is critical in this conversation and using an oil that has a favorable ratio of omega-3 fats to omega-6 fats is the starting point. Provide organic, organic and chemical-free meals. I think this is even more important for the most vulnerable populations, children, the critically ill, the elderly. These are the populations who really need to have optimal support and have a lower tolerance or an inability to deal with a higher toxic burden. So pesticides and other agrochemicals found on specific uh, fruits and vegetables. And again, I encourage people to look at the environmental working group. That's www.ewg.org. It's an excellent resource for looking at fruits and vegetables with the highest levels of pesticides and then looking at uh, the clean 15, which can be, you know, chosen on a regular basis very safely, even if they're conventional. Avoid exposure to cyanobacter. It's a blue-green algae. It's being found in uh, fish and shellfish at an alarming rate, particularly from warmer waters. Uh, and this climate change and the increasing temperatures of, of much of our oceans is really contributing to these, these blooms. And cyanobacter produces a toxin that is very damaging to our mitochondria. So if you're going to eat fish and shellfish, you really want those to come from um, very cold marine source, sources. Choose carbohydrates uh, wisely. You know, limit your fruit consumption to, or your patient's fruit consumption to those which have the lowest fructose contents and really eliminate fruit juice and fruit juice concentrates if they're going to provide any source of, uh, of calorie. It's not to say that, you know, fruit juice can't be consumed in very small quantities as part of a recipe if it lends itself to that. But, you know, drinking fruit juice or having fruit juice being added as one of the top ingredients to a food product is, is never a good fit. And lastly, and, and I think it's important to really focus on the details in the statement, eat whole unrefined plant-based diets as opposed to just that message of just plant-based. There are a lot of plant-based ingredients that are highly refined and have high glycemic burdens. You know, whether that's fruit juice, which some people look at as being plant-based or a grain or cereal product that, you know, might be very high in its carbohydrate density. It's too easy to say, uh, just eat plant-based. You really have to choose whole plant-based foods um, as a foundation uh, for your diet and your patient's diets so that everything will really start to work in their favor, especially with respect to mitochondrial health. Because the glycemic burden that one experiences is a big part of the mitochondrial story. If we have higher levels of glycemic you know, burden on the body, so we have more insulin resistance, that, that hyperglycemia, those surges in blood sugar levels drive the glycosylation process in the body, and that in itself can be damaging to the mitochondria. So lower carbohydrate densities across the board, um, lower glycemic burdens being placed on the body by eating whole plant-based ingredients is a critical component of a path towards better mitochondrial health. So these are the five principles that would offer patients the greatest return on their behavior change and the greatest response with respect to mitochondrial health. And, you know, again, I know that there is a lot to this talk, um, but the oil change and the carbohydrate choices are critical. And there's a great paper, um, again, that this is something any of you can access online free um, by Nicholson and Ash, and it's on the importance of lipid therapy, which is looking at, when you look at a mitochondrial membrane under an electron microscope, it becomes really clear um, what the source of the pathology is there. And an oil change, in essence, is required for mitochondria to become more functional or to resuscitate what you can from that population. This is an excellent paper um, looking at that lipid replacement therapy as an approach. These are some papers in addition to those which I referenced uh, in the previous slides. These are six other papers that highlight uh, the effects of either fructose or omega-6 oils on mitochondrial health in, in different conditions or on different organ systems. So I think these would be interested, uh, these would be very interesting for those of you who would like to learn more about this particular aspect of human health.
I know some of this information can be daunting, uh, you know, especially if you look at maybe what you have advocated for your patients over the last, you know, several years or decades. You know, sometimes when we look at this information, it's um, it's really difficult because we know that we went with a message that either we were taught in graduate school, we learned along the way. This may question some of that, especially when we get to the types of fats and carbohydrates that we are recommending for people. I feel that most participants today would understand the importance of environment in minimizing environmental uh, toxin exposure. But when we come to the topic of omega-6 uh, rich seed oils or the importance of keeping fruit consumption modest and selecting fruits which are have the lowest glycemic index, you know, I find that sometimes that really strikes a nerve with clinicians who have maybe recommended for greater fruit consumption to their patients, again, with the best intentions. But I would encourage you, uh, you know, before you maybe get frustrated or uh, look at things through that lens, just to take a look at this research, uh, come at it with an open mind, and I think you'll find that it serves you and your patients uh, in the best way possible. I know it certainly did for me as I started to delve into this uh, material at, at a deeper level 10, 10 to 12 years ago. Um, it was very different from what I learned in graduate school. So times, you know, they, they change. Information changes, and it's important that we keep pace with that science. Um, so with that, um, I'd love to hear any questions that you have now. At this time, I'll do my best to answer them. Um, so if anyone, you know, would like to to send those questions in, it'd be great. All right, thank you, John. Um, do you, can you advance to the next slide? Do you have? Sure. There we go. Yeah, so um, as you all get your questions in, um, this is Catherine, I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist and I'm gonna help out with the questions here. So that will conclude the formal presentation and just to share with those who have not joined us before, um, Functional Formularies does have new products, a Liquid Hope and Nourish Peptide Formula, as well as new ketogenic formulas. Um, on the next slide, you will see different features of these formulas. So um, for the peptide, they are the first organic whole food formulas. As with all other Functional Formularies products, they're made with the highest quality ingredients. They're certified organic. Um, these will have a blend of pea protein and also um, contain MCT oil. Um, they are considered nutritionally complete. Um, and you can find more of these nutritional values on the website. Um, and if you are interested on the next side, you will see a way to contact the team. So um, can you advance to the next one, John? Yep. And so, um, so if you're interested in trying the new formulas, email sample at functionalformularies.com. You can receive a sample, the startup kit, um, and there are reps in your area that can further assist you. So um, we will go ahead and jump into questions here. To start, John, there's a few on, can you clarify um, the controversy around canola oil and why it's promoted as heart healthy um, as opposed to kind of what we're presenting here? Yeah, sure. You know, I think canola oil um, serves as a good example for a overall a consistent recommendation on a public health model, not just, you know, by the American Heart Association, but by many different groups. Um, it was looked at as a healthy oil because it lowers cholesterol levels. And, you know, what we need to understand is that lowering cholesterol levels, despite how pervasive this is as a myth, it is, that is not associated with improved outcomes. Um, again, that's why I tried to conclude with that statement about, you know, just trying to step back and think about the recommendations maybe we've made as clinicians or what we learned 20 years ago. Um, the canola oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, soybean oil, and you'll see a reference to a paper on soybean oil and what that's been shown to do to the mitochondrial membrane. And soybean oil and canola oil are very, very similar in their attributes. They have been recommended because they lower cholesterol levels, and we have been steered away from butter coconut oil um, in, in saturated fats because those typically cause modest to significant increases in our serum cholesterol levels. But what's important in this conversation is that we do not evaluate a food or an oil 
um, solely on what it does to a, you know, a, a patient's cholesterol levels, because we know that serum cholesterol levels, are, again, are not associated with, let's just say, heart disease, like many of us assume. Um, you know, we've given other talks here um, through this forum, webinars on on fatty acids and cholesterol and, and really the relationship of those. And what we need to understand is how does a fat influence the incidence of heart disease? And on, if we want to look at a particular biomarker, let's look at small, dense LDLs, um, a form of cholesterol where it's highly oxidizable, can infiltrate the artery lining. That's very different than looking at serum cholesterol or total cholesterol. So that's why canola oil, I mean, first of all, canola oil is very inexpensive. It's a very cheap ingredient. Um, you know, rapeseed as a crop produces massive quantities of oil or, and or calories. So it's been relied on and it's grown in, you know, northern, you know, northern United States and Canada. It's an abundant crop. It's close. So, you know, those are all the different factors that have led us to this place where it's looked at um, and given that, you know, that red heart at the grocery store <laughs> and it's given, uh, you know, such a high status. But uh, we'd all do much better with olive oil, coconut oil or butter. And with um, same train of thought, but in reference to polyunsaturated fatty acids triggering calcium leakage, leakage from cardiac tissue, is this calcium the cause of calcification of arterial, arterial walls that can be seen on a coronary artery scan? It can be. There are different contributors to that um, calcium. We know that depending on the tissue in the body, uh, in the case of, you know, uh, a more of a classic ischemia that that calcium can be can be leaking out of cardiac tissue that happens in things like congestive heart failure it happens in a different number of different pathologies of cardiac tissue so that calcium can come from what's leaking from cardiac tissue now calcium is uh, is showing up on you know a carotid artery that's not going to be um, it's not going to be as likely that's coming from leakage that's going to be from calcium that is used by the body in essence as a band-aid. Calcium, we put, you know, the human body puts calcium anywhere there's high levels of inflammation or injury. So it can come from uh, the body's calcium pools in circulation and it can come from, from tissues where it's leaking. It really just depends on where that calcium is showing up. There are a few questions on um, algae related to your slide on cyanobacteria. So, um, concerns over, or would you have concerns over things like algae oil for someone um, who's vegan or vegetarian as a source of omega-3s, um, spirulina, blue-green algae powder, uh, et cetera? Well, I don't know with respect to um, the algae that is being used to derive DHA. I would doubt I would doubt that it's going to be an issue with that. That has to, that's a very specific algae, and I would doubt that it's contaminated with cyanobacter. But again, I don't know. I would be concerned with any blue-green algae that is being consumed directly. Um, spirulina is a type of blue-green algae, but it is not uh, the cyanobacter that um, is associated with algae blooms and and produces that neurotoxin. So I would be concerned that there were um, quality control uh, point checkpoints in place with any spirulina production. Um, I know some people look at it as a um, as a superfood. I I personally don't. I look at it as a potential risk. Um, but if there are quality control points in place, I you know it should not be an issue. But I I know that blue green algae um, is being looked at by epidemiologists more closely than ever, given how it is now being shown um, to be responsible, whether wh whether that's coming from seafood consumption, spending time or recreating on on lakes or freshwater bodies where there's these algae blooms. It's it's really being linked to um, these kind of these outbreaks, so to speak, over a short period of time of ALS and Parkinson's. So it's clearly linked. Um, but I, yeah, I would be I would be concerned about any algae someone's consuming that is called a blue green algae. I want to make sure that there were um, there was quality control in place to make sure you weren't getting cyanobacter. Okay, and can you repeat the um, the fructose intake? 
amount that you recommended or the upper limit? And do you have recommendations on how you um, uh, communicate with your with your patients on how you would eat fruit in your yeah. diet? Yeah, sure, that's an easy one. Um, again, Robert Lustig, who I'm sure many of our participants today are familiar with, he has done some unbelievable work at the University of California, San Francisco on fructose and its contributions to you know, diabetes and issues in, in pediatric health. He's got some great papers. Um, he's got his own website. You know, so Robert Lustig and others, not just Robert, they've shown that we have a, an, a limited ability to safely or in a healthy way metabolize fructose. Some is okay, but it's around 10 grams per meal. Um, you know, a banana has typically around 10 to 11 grams. So that's about it, what people would be able to tolerate and around 25 grams per day. And in terms of how I work with patients or how would I advise a clinician, I would have patients consume berries and citrus fruits. If you want a really simple message, berries and citrus fruits tend to be much, much lower in their fructose content than fruits such as grapes, mangoes, and pears. Um, you know, if we're eating a mango and having dried fruit or we're, you know, we're using you know, those types of fruits uh, two to three times per day, it's very easy to consume an exceedingly high amount of fructose. So I really just, I try to um, have clinicians and for those populations that I work with, I, I really try to get them to eat lower fructose fruits, um, not use any sweeteners. Obviously that's, you know, that's a, a very easy, easy way to minimize fructose. Don't drink fruit juice. And when you do those things, then the small amount of fructose that a patient might get from something like I mean, a sweet potato might be one to two percent fructose. The rest of it's glucose. Uh, a baked potato is about a hundred percent glucose, and and rice is a hundred percent glucose. So there are these choices where it's almost entirely a glucose-based carbohydrate or food. And those are the better ones um, to go with. Does the oxidation of saturated fats not produce free radicals, which would cause mitochondrial damage? Exactly. Saturated fat is very resistant to oxidation. It doesn't have any double bonds. So once a fatty acid, um, once it's free of those double bonds, then it's extremely resistant. Even olive oil, which has one double bond, but also contains some unique substances, often in close proximity with the fatty acids, even that is very resistant to oxidation. It's when you get into the polyunsaturated or the presence of multiple double bonds that there's ample room for oxygen to react with those fatty acids. And that's where, you know, that's where things take a, a, a turn for the worse in a hurry. Is there a direct relationship with mitochondrial health and insulin resistance? Well, that would be an association at this time. Um, there, there are certainly, Researchers that feel the two do have crosstalk or there's a contributing factor of mitochondrial issues to, to insulin resistance. Um, but at this time, we, we tend to see people with diabetes have much higher um, levels of mitochondrial pathology. You know, some of that may, as I explained earlier in the talk, the mechanism behind that would be dysglycemia, higher levels of sugar in the bloodstream, driving the glycosylation of proteins in the body, um, higher circulating levels of fructose and the metabolism of that fructose contributing more methylglyoxal um, to mitochondria and causing that, you know, the loss of mitochondria through that mechanism. So I, I think that the, it's certainly a plausible mechanism, but at this point, diabetes um, is considered to be associated with mitochondrial dysfunction as opposed to um, one being seen as the cause of the other. Okay, and there's, um, looks like we're close to time, so just a few more. I'll answer this one just on the formulas, a few questions about um, can the formulas be taken by mouth? And the answer is yes. So because they're food, all functional formularies products can also be um, used as oral formulas in addition to enterols. So um, many people heat and use as a soup or as the base of a smoothie. I mean, actually the new ketogenic formulas, if you go on the website, will have, there's a cookbook associated with how you can actually use them in recipes, um, which is a really great resource. So um, 
this is coming up a lot too. We hear it often, but how uh, how does avocado oil fit into the discussion around healthy fats? I think it's excellent. It has um, the majority of the fat in an avocado is monounsaturated, very similar to olive oil. Uh, it, you know, depending on whether you're using avocado oil or an avocado, you're going to get obviously in a whole um, plant ingredient like an avocado, you're going to get you know more upside. But avocado oil has a high high resistance to oxidation. Um, it, it's a very healthy oil, and I you know I could have certainly included it there with olive oil. It's just not one that's as as um, as abundant in, in food production, but it's excellent, absolutely. Okay, and um, to end with, um, and hopefully we can address more of these and please feel free to email if you have any specific questions, um, but I think we have time for one more. Um, Let's see, another around fructose. Are the changes noticed in the brain when fructose is consumed in children of different ages reversed when fructose is eliminated? You know, that's a great question. I, I, I am not familiar with any research that looks at a fructose restriction on brain health in children. Now, again, Robert Lustig has excellent, um, an excellent uh, paper, and again, it's free online, um, and it looked at children who had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. They were put on a fructose restriction, and in essence, it resolved the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So we do have evidence that fructose restriction has very favorable effects on pediatric health in different areas, but with respect to brain health, I am not familiar um, with a study that has that type of intervention and then a follow-up period. All right. Well, thank you. I think that was great. So um, we will wrap up for today. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to email us. Um, for dietitians, the CE certificate um, is pending approval. So once approved, we will go ahead and send that to you um, as soon as possible. And um, any any last words, John? No, uh, not really, Catherine. Thank you for uh, for helping with this today. And I, I just want to reiterate one last time: um, don't don't be overwhelmed by this information. If some of it's new and you think that maybe you've been steering people in the wrong direction for a while, I you know I think that clinicians we all do our best to uh, give people the most helpful information. And so just you know read read the papers that you're interested in within this. Um, in, in really try to come to some of your own conclusions, but it's uh, it's really clear that we've been influenced by that lipid theory for too long, eating, recommending foods which are um, low in saturated fat because of how they lower cholesterol levels. It's really, it's taken us down the, the wrong road in, in so many ways, especially with respect to mitochondrial health that, you know, look at coconut oil and butter and obviously olive oil, and avocado oil, look at those as your um, your more fundamental or foundational fats. And I think once, once, whether it's a clinician or a consumer, once we start doing that, it really opens us up to, uh, you know, healthier food choices, healthier recipes, uh, you name it. So I just want to end on that because I know so many people feel conflicted around coconut oil and butter because they've heard for so long that saturated fat is a recipe for heart disease. When in fact, it's really a foundation for healthy tissues in the body. So thanks again, Catherine. I appreciate your help with this today. Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us and we will see you next time.